Minnesota 35 of Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hello, everyone. Before I begin today, I want to thank our sponsors. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. Now today I spoke with two guests, Jesse Felder, founder of the Felder Report, and Michael Leibowitz, partner at 720 Global and Real Investment Advice. We began today's conversation by discussing Jesse's latest post about Warren Buffett saying that bonds are a terrible investment, but according to his own methods, stocks look even worse. We talked about the inflation outlook, gold, U.S. dollar, the possible unwinding of the risk parity trade, execution of macro ideas, FANG stocks, and the similarities between the dot-com boom versus now. As usual, thank you all for listening, and please enjoy this episode. Jesse, Michael, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here, Anthony. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. It's great to be here with you and Jesse. All right, guys, great to speak with the two of you today. We've got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to dive right into it. I want to begin with you, Jesse, and your latest post. Uh, you talked about how Warren Buffett thinks bonds are a terrible investment. And then you said, but according to his own method, stocks look even worse. And then I remember seeing you retweet Larry McDonald, uh, a quote that Warren Buffett had said, if I had to bet my life on higher or lower inflation, I'd bet a lot higher. And of course, I went and read your post, as I always do. And, and at the end of your post, I thought it was very interesting, and I want you to talk about this a little bit. Uh, you said, and inflation is indeed going to make a comeback, as Buffett suggests. Investors will want to make sure they limit their exposure to both kinds of financial, financial assets. Additionally, they will want to ensure that they have adequate exposure to other asset classes, most importantly, real ones. And then you send us an, uh, another one of your posts. So Jesse, talk to us about this. Well, yeah, I think it's you know pretty clear that that Warren is starting to to worry about inflation. Um, he says bonds are a terrible investment, or at least he did at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. That was curious to me that you know he's still recommending stocks and still you know says that he likes stocks because his you know valuation measure, which is basically the comparing the size of the stock market to the economy, is essentially at very I mean the same levels it was in late 1999. Um, so it says that. And back in 2001, he wrote a, uh, a piece for Fortune saying, you know, this was should have been a clear warning to investors in 99, 2000 that equities were way overvalued. Um, clearly, he doesn't feel the same way about the stock market today. But, uh, you know, the value of this this indicator is that it's really good at forecasting future 10 year returns in the stock market. And today it's suggesting that uh, the total return for investors you know, average annual returns can be negative, you know, two, three percent, something like that per year over the next 10. And if interest rates go up, you know, I mean, the, what's really been the tailwind for financial assets over the last 35 years is falling interest rates. So interest rates go down, bond prices go up, but it also lowers the discount rate for stocks. So stock prices have benefited, too. And we've seen valuations you know, from 1980, you know, PE ratios were, were tiny single digits to now we're, you know, 25 PE ratio on the S&P 500. And so if interest rates are going to go back up as a, you know, part of a renewal of inflation, it's going to be bad for both all kinds of financial assets, anything that's discounted, you know, by an interest rate. So, um, you know, both stocks and bonds are probably going to, you know, uh, not do very well in that type of an environment, a rising interest rate environment. And the best way to protect yourself in an inflationary environment is to own real assets. And uh, I think the most important one of those is is gold. Um, it just is is the ideal inflation hedge. And um, you know, with the 
the currency wars, I think, heating back up uh, again. Um, it's going to be you know, gold is going to be and just an integral part of any diversified portfolio going forward. Hey, Anthony, um, I would like to add to that because unless you're about 60 years old or older, you've never seen a bond bear market. So, so for the last 30, 40 years, we have seen, you've never been a professional during a bull market, a bond uh, bear market. So we have become accustomed to buying stocks and hedging them with bonds, the old 60, 40, 70, 30 type portfolios. And we have to consider that maybe this bull market in bonds is over. And if so, how do we reposition? And like Jesse is saying, commodities and gold offer something that gets you outside of the equity and bond boxes. All right, Michael, I want to stay with you here for just a moment. I've heard both of you mention gold already in this episode. And if I remember correctly, Jesse said that investors are going to want to have real assets in their portfolio and gold is going to be an integral part uh, of any portfolio going forward. So I'm under the assumption after you just mentioning people having to reposition and you mentioned commodities and gold that you're on the same page with Jesse that you think that people are going to have to own gold going forward. Uh, I, I do think that gold is a great place to be. Doesn't mean you should hunker down and own 100% gold, but I think every portfolio should have an allocation to gold. Um, and that allocation should probably be increasing at the moment. There are an incredible amount of risks out there, geopolitical and financial. The unwinding of QE, both here and soon to come, in, potentially in Europe and Japan, introduces even greater risks. And like Jesse was saying, inflationary pressures are starting to show themselves. They're not, they're not large right now, but but they are starting to show themselves. So inflation protection should become something that investors are thinking about and planning for. And I think gold has traditionally been a great place to be, um, especially when there's monetary shenanigans going on in addition to inflation. Okay, Jesse, I'd like to go back to you here for a couple of thoughts. First is on the possible unwinding of the risk parity trade. I've been talking about the possible unwinding of the risk parity trade for a couple of years. It hasn't really happened, but I'm not playing it on a longer term basis. But on the short term basis, I am very aware of situations when stocks are going lower with bonds and treasuries, especially when they're breaking down on daily charts together. I think that's a major risk for the stock market. So I'm curious what you think about that. Talking about execution of what you're seeing, I mean, you mentioned that you don't think that equities are going to do so well over the next 10 years. So if you don't think equities are going to do so well and you think that people should have should own some gold. I'm just wondering, how are you executing that that type of strategy? That's a great question, and I do agree with you. I think that uh, there are p potential trap doors um, in the equity market. They're probably greater than they have been in a, in a very long time. And as a function, it's not just risk parity. I think risk parity is basically a, just one version of the short volatility trade. And I'm talking about you know specifically short VIX. But also, you've seen a lot of investors go short puts. Um, I think we've seen a lot of investors, you know, just retail investors, you know, buying products that are essentially selling insurance in a lot of different respects. And these things, you know, have, uh, you know, very asymmetric risk reward. That opens up these kinds of risks to the market. But the the way I I traded personally, which is not right for everyone, but I, I I'm long and short, so. I own things that I think are equities that I think are going to do well going forward that, that you know fit my discipline that I think are super cheap and out of favor. Um, I like things that have a lot of insider buying, and then I'll look to hedge my gen that general market risk that I'm 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 worried about through um, some type of a hedging strategy, either you know uh, some type of a, a tail hedging using you know put options or. Just shorting, um, you know. Usually for me, it's it's the broad indexes, so major ETFs versus what I own, um, and so that that's how I manage that risk. I think for the average investor, probably the best way to do it is to just limit their exposure to equities to something that is is tolerable for them. You look at you know the greatest asset allocators on the planet. Meb Faber's written some great books on the topic, and the most aggressive guys in terms of a broad asset allocation have maybe. 
25, 35% in U.S. equities. And you compare that to the average investor who might be 70, 80% in U.S. equities right now, and they're far more aggressive than the most successful and most aggressive uh, asset allocators um, in the world. So I think that that's a, a mismatch there that most investors aren't paying attention to. They're just far, far too heavy, heavily weighted towards U.S. equities. Gotcha. Thank you, Jesse, for that explanation. Now, Michael, I'd like to go back to you with these same questions. Are you following the possible unwinding of the risk parity trade? Do you think it could happen? Uh, and talk to us about how you're executing, because you also feel that you don't think that stocks are going to do so well going forward, and you think that everyone should own a little bit of gold. So talk to us about how you're executing that strategy. So Yes, it can certainly happen, and it will accentuate moves in both stock and bond markets. Uh, I take a similar approach with Jesse. I believe in being long or short. I grew up as a bond trader where whether you were long or short, no one cared. It wasn't voodoo or, or, or bad to be short. So, so I've always considered markets, you know, you buy what's cheap and you sell what's rich. And sometimes you're net long, sometimes you're net short. Uh, but I think individual investors should also start thinking about very short term. If rates are going to go up, short-term bonds or floaters or tips that actually increase in rate as yields go up are a nice place to start. They should try to look for stocks that represent value. Um, they're hard to find these days, but there are certainly some out there. Uh, related to gold, the gold miners, there are still a few gold miners that are trading below net asset value. Um, so you could essentially buy the company, liquidate all their assets and make money. Um, it's rare to find, but, but they exist. So I think you just have to take a different approach and be careful and forget about the last 10 years and think about the future. Thanks for that explanation, Michael. Now I want to stay with you here for just a moment and I want to talk about the dollar. I've heard both of you say that you guys like gold. You think gold is probably going higher. Right away, the trader and me, I watch gold versus the dollar all the time as an opposite correlation thinks, okay, if they like gold to go higher, they probably think the dollar is going lower, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth. So Michael, what do you think about the dollar? So a couple of things with the dollar. Uh, first of all, I think the usage of the dollar worldwide as a reserve currency is slowly shrinking. So net demand for the dollar will slowly over time decline. Second, and this gets a little political, but I think Trump's goal is to decrease. If Trump wants to accomplish many of his goals, especially regarding manufacturing, he's going to have to decrease the value of the dollar to make our goods more, uh, to, to be able to sell our goods abroad. Uh, so while we are seeing a little bit of a dollar rally here, I think it's more of a dead cat bounce. Um, and I think we can go to much lower levels on the dollar, which again, even if the even if it is not, even if it doesn't create inflation beyond two or three percent, it tends to be very good for gold, precious metals, and other commodities. Jesse, are you looking at the dollar uh, versus anything that you're doing in gold? A absolutely, and I think the the number one driver for the dollar longer term is you know the fiscal situation you look at the uh, the deficits you know deficits relative to gdp and it has a high correlation with the dollar so deficits i think this is the first time maybe in history where the deficit is widening during an economic expansion and that's that should be pretty troublesome to anybody who owns dollars i think and so uh you know it's expected to expand um even without recession over the next few years so that's kind of a the longer term backdrop for the dollar i think which is negative but then i think you look at relative monetary policy and we've been you know raising rates for you know two and a half years or something now and uh you know the the, the ecb and the the bank of japan are are still, you know, pursuing extremely aggressive policy, but they are going to be forced to unwind that. This these inflationary forces are global forces. Um, that's what all the companies, you know, in the last quarter were saying. Um, it's not just a, a U.S. phenomenon, and so these other central banks are going to be forced to try and play catch up with the Fed. And the Fed, you know, after raising rates, I mean, if we get two or three more rate rises this year, um, you know, I think we're going to start looking at. Uh, we're already seeing it rising credit card delinquencies and things, and I think the Fed's going to start to worry about um, the damage they're doing to the consumer and highly leveraged companies. It's almost half the companies in the Russell 2000 have floating rate debt. 
um, and have to refinance a ton of debt over the next you know year, two years. Um, so there's going to be some credit problems, I think, creeping up in our economy that's going to maybe make the Fed think twice about raising rates as rapidly as they, has been, as they have been. Then you have the ECB and the Bank of Japan that's going to have to start under unwinding policy because we're seeing wage growth in Japan. We're seeing wage growth in, in Germany like we haven't seen in a long time. They're going to be forced to start fighting inflation, and that's going to be bullish for their currencies. Hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show so far, but I want to pause and thank one of our sponsors, Trading Technologies. I started using TT in the year 2000, and I love it. It is by far the best trading platform I have ever used, and I've tried a lot of them. With TT, you can trade the global markets from virtually anywhere in the world. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. I highly suggest you go try out TT, especially because you can try it for free. Just go to tryttnow.com and set up your account. All right, let's stay with inflation and go back to Michael here. Michael, you recently wrote a post called Stoking the Embers of Inflation. I noticed that Jesse retweeted it, so I'm sure he's going to have some comments on it as well. So, Michael, talk to us about that post. So it's a very counterintuitive post, and, and actually it was very counterintuitive to me when I was analyzing it and doing the research uh, before I wrote it. And it's based on a, a very well-known identity, uh, economic identity, which basically can be algebraically rearranged to say that the change in price or inflation equals how much money is out there, the monetary base, plus velocity, which is how many times, how often money is being respent, minus GDP. And I focus significantly on the monetary supply and the velocity. And I know this is getting complicated, but the bottom line is that velocity, based on prior regressions that has almost a 95% uh, R squared, shows that when money supply is increased, it actually can have a deflationary effect. And when money supply is decreased, it can have an inflationary effect if we take away the GDP component. Uh, now, now, that sounds crazy. Printing money should be inflationary. But if you go back and look, when we were printing money, 2008, 2009, that was the only time that we saw CPI and the deflator go red, go negative. Uh, and we've had a very low, in, very low inflation for the last 10 years under this QE regime. Interestingly, now that the money supply is just slowly declining, and it's they've they've done the Fed has declined it by next to nothing, but it has declined. We're starting to see whispers of inflation. Um, so I encourage you to read the article, and it, it kind of thinks outside of the box. But it, you know, if the regressions of the past hold up, it portends inflation, and to me, that's a big problem for the Fed with so much debt outstanding. If we get inflation, they're going to have to fight that. And when they fight it, they're going to push rates higher, which is going to have a big negative economic effect. So it's really the trap that the Fed somehow must avoid. Jesse, I'm curious of your thoughts on Michael's post. Well, yeah, and I think the easiest way to, to describe it is, uh, you know, it, it mathematically explains what Bill White told me when I interviewed him a year ago. Bill White was the chief economist for the BIS. And, uh, you know, we were talking a year ago about this on, on, on my podcast. And he said, you know, everybody thought QE was going to be inflationary. It turned out it was deflationary, right? Because all the, the debt creation that inspired created overcapacity, probably the best example is that in the oil markets, they just created, they were able to just pump so much oil because the, the debt was so easy that it created an oversupply of oil. And so it was, uh, was hence, you know, disinflationary or even deflationary. Um, so it stands to reason that if QE was disinflationary or deflationary, even that QT, quantitative tightening, the unwinding of this policy would be inflationary. And I think that's what Michael demonstrates in, in the post. Why this is interesting is because now that the Fed is unwinding this policy and, and potentially stoking inflation uh, at the same time. This is what could lead to the expiration of the Fed put. If the Fed is forced to fight inflation, and they're not able to pursue these easy policies. You know, say the market goes down as a reaction of a big spike in inflation. Uh, and the Fed goes, okay, well, now we need to resort to QE to try and save the markets again because we can't risk this wealth effect unwinding. 
um, if inflation is is a problem, they're not able to, to to pursue those policies to come in and save the market, and and so this is really what is the to me what is the the, the biggest misunderstanding or uh, false belief behind the current bubble in equities right now. It's that it's the Fed will save us, and if inflation prevents them from doing that, that's how this potentially could all unwind. Yeah, man, that is that is very interesting. Go, ahead, you were going to say something, Michael. Yeah, think about the risk parity trade now. If you have a Fed that has to raise interest rates to try to fight inflation, and at the same time the market is tanking and they can't do anything about it because they're trying to unload their balance sheet, how does how does you know again like Jesse said, the Fed put is gone, and what does that do for uh, faith in in stocks and bonds? Yeah, exactly. I could talk all day about this, but I want to move on. I have a couple more topics I want to talk to you guys about, and. I want to go back to you for a second, Jesse. As much as it pains me, I'm going to talk about the FANG stocks a little bit. And I say that really uh, because, look, I've been trading S&Ps for almost 20 years. There's always a handful of stocks that are going to move the index. And this FANG stocks, is it, it really does matter. Uh, I don't want to say that it does, but it does. And I know that a lot of people out there watch it and, and how it impacts the industry. So I have to keep an eye on it. And you've been very vocal talking about the GDPR regulations and uh, focusing on the backlash against these big tech. How do you see this all panning out for the FANG stocks? Well, I, you know, I've, I've been harping on this probably a little too much um, lately, but I do think it is is one of the most important, you know, maybe a second to inflation and one of the most important trends right now. The FANG stocks are a bigger percentage of the NASDAQ uh, than they ever have been. Um, they're really the, the driving force behind the bull market. And so um, investors are clearly... Um, you know, willing to put money behind the idea that these companies are going to dominate 10 years from now. And, and that's usually not how the markets work. In fact, the biggest companies in the market are rarely the same companies over 10 year periods. But you can see right now with this backlash against big tech, the problems that are creeping up. I think there's a direct bullseye on their business models right now, especially the ones that are advertising based. Um, People are beginning to realize the power these companies have, not just in the marketplace, but over consumers. And uh, you know, this the search engine. Um, there, you know, there's research coming out recently that the search engine is one of the most um, efficient ways to manipulate people's thinking ever created, you know, by humankind. And so, you can do simple things. You know how you see Google um, suggested, you know, topics. You type in Hillary Clinton, and it suggests if it's a, if it suggests. Hillary Clinton is, um, you know, a liar. That influences how people vote. If it's if it suggests Hillary Clinton is winning, you know, that in influences how people vote, and actually has an 80 percent um, success rate in influencing people's thinking about a certain topic. So, I think people don't realize how much. Generally, people don't realize how much power these companies have, not just in the marketplace, but over the way people think. And over, you know, and we've seen it in you know elections and things around the world. There's a small number of people. It began with some insiders in Silicon Valley who are really beginning to blow the whistle here. Roger McNamee, Tristan Harris, and a number of other people said this. This is crazy. Uh, the power these companies have. Politicians, especially in Europe, are just now beginning to figure this out and figure out how dangerous it is potentially to undermining democracy and these things. And there, there are people that are that are becoming um, the, the the will to regulate these things, potentially break them up, is just only becoming stronger and stronger. And it's it's amazing to me that people think, oh, this will just blow over, because it's it's not. In fact, all the trends point the other direction that these companies' business models are under attack by regulators, and that that will to do that is is only growing stronger with every day. Michael, is this something that you've been following, uh, GDPR and the FANG stocks and potential impact on the market? I have. Not as, mu not as much as Jess has been on it, but I, I, I'm thinking about it more from a user's perspective. And when you start paying attention to your Twitter account, to your Facebook account, you'll notice how targeted some of those ads are. And it's starting to get creepy for me. Um, and I think it is for other people as well. So the question for me is, how will usage over time develop and will people start caring about their privacy again? And that has that can have a massive effect um, on the company. 
Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I can't see how it doesn't. Uh, I've noticed it as well, uh, and I'm on Twitter mostly. I think like you guys are, but it is pretty incredible how you could just do a basic search of something or you know look at flights. The next thing you know, uh, they're they're showing you ads. Uh, you know, come to the Bahamas. It's really it, it's pretty pretty crazy. I, well, I, I, and I would. Yeah, I would just add to that that users don't understand the costs related with this. Um, the, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, I'm not being manipulated. I can, you know, I can manage my own uh, emotions." And and science says otherwise. But I think the one thing that users should understand is that you're going to pay. You could potentially pay higher uh, rates for airline flights. You could potentially be denied a loan. You could potentially be denied a job. You know, a lot of these different things. Um, you know, that, that you're being discriminated against based on your search history, based on your likes on Facebook. And so I don't think people ever realize the fact that I may not even ever see this one job opportunity because the company doesn't want people that fall into this box. And so the discrimination that's happening against users already as a function of all this data mining is very significant. And um, people don't realize, I think, the costs to them from giving away all this information and allowing themselves to be categorized in these ways. I would add one thing to that as well. These companies, at least Facebook, Google, Twitter, they are advertising companies. So investors better understand that they're advertising companies and the amount of advertising dollars has stayed very close to 1% of GDP. So the question is, what percentage of that revenue can they get? Can they steal from the traditional networks and from the billboards and from radio and from more traditional advertising and how much can they garner from abroad. But it's not an unlimited pool of revenue that these companies are looking at. So at valuations such as today, I hope investors understand what they're really buying. Uh, that's an excellent point, Michael. And you know, Jesse, you, you've also been talking about the misallocation of capital or male investment during this recent half cycle. And you said you're seeing similarities from the dot-com boom to now. What are you seeing that's similar? Well, I think the most obvious similarity is just the number of um, companies that are um, coming to market that are you know, not profit-making. And I think really Amazon is really the model here. Uh, you know, we want to just take share. We don't care, you know, how much money we lose in the process. There's a bunch of, you know, companies. Um, I think what was the statistic? 76% of companies that went public in 2017 had negative earnings, um, the highest level since the dot com mania. And I think the dot com mania just got over 80%. So we're seeing the same number of loss making companies come public. Uh, and so, you know, when you're when you're funding a lot of these loss making companies, the 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 dot com Bubble was a good example of of how that ends up for investors. You know, most of those companies. How many companies in the Nasdaq went down ninety percent plus in the bust and uh, and never came back? I mean, hundred um, percent. What's different this time than the dot com main is it's not just these loss making businesses coming to market. We're still funding a, a ton of zombie companies um, that are able to get funding. Zombie companies, I think, are you know. Uh, basically defined by companies who don't earn enough operating income to meet their interest obligations. And it's something like 15% of the companies in the S&P 500 meet that, that standard, which is higher than any time in history. Uh, but there's just countless examples. I mean, in, in my mind, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is another example of a huge malinvestment. I mean, how much money is poured into these things with what economic value to show for it? Um, and like I said, I think there's just countless examples of malinvestment and misallocation of capital that will only be revealed um, during the next downturn. Michael, are, are you seeing these uh, similarities from the dot-com boom that Jesse speaks about to now? Well, I just see it throughout the economy, and I've written a lot about this. Basically, a lot of money is being borrowed into non-productive uses. And the problem with that is if you're not productively borrowing, using money for productive purposes, it's not creating income to pay that debt off. Uh, and there's a reason why productivity growth in America and most, most developed nations in the world is flat to declining. And at the core of economic growth is productivity. Without productivity, you either need demographics or debt. And we've seen debt replace productivity and demographics become a problem awfully soon as well due to the aging baby boomers. Uh, so it's, you know, it's the government, it's, it's individuals, it's 
look at the size of average square foot the average square footage of homes now is almost a thousand square feet more than it was 30 years ago that's it, it, it's nice but it's it's not productive investment and i would just point out a, a couple other things too i mean i during the dot-com mania, we saw a massive build-out in telecom. Companies like Global Crossing laid fiber optic cable. I don't know how many times they could cover the earth. Uh, and they all went bankrupt. Um, and it was just a huge overcapacity, overbuilding of that just as a function of the euphoria surrounding the, the internet bubble. Um, I think you know the build-out of cloud computing today could maybe prove to be something similar to that. But I think maybe the greatest misallocation of capital today that I'm seeing is all of the borrowing on company balance sheets, I mean, leverage is off the charts, or at least as high as it's ever been, but, um, new highs um, in leverage, corporate leverage. And a lot of that's just going to stock buybacks, which, you know, there's nothing, no no, no economic, um, uh, I guess, gain to, to, to show for that. Um, so these companies are just leveraging up their balance sheets to retire equity. And if that were done on economic terms, you know, this comes back to the, the where we started with the Buffett post. Um, if equities were generally a good investment, then the buybacks would potentially make sense because they could. Uh, but when, when you're buying back stock at valuations that make no sense from an investment standpoint, you're basically just burning money in a, in a way to enrich executives. Um, because a lot of these buybacks are ser- simply to to uh, ameliorate the um, issuance of shares and to allow uh, executives to have somebody to, to sell their shares to when they exercise stock options. So um, I think there's just countless you know, examples of this. And um, it's, you know, it happens during every boom, but it also makes the, 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 the following bust uh, more, more painful and more difficult. I, I would just add on the topic of Warren Buffett, he railed on stock buybacks uh, in the late 90s, in specific when companies were buying stock above the intrinsic value of the company. Now it's interesting that he's buying companies like Apple, whose stock price is well above its intrinsic value, who are buying back shares as quickly as they can. Uh, so it's a lot of double speak there. Last question today for you guys. We're pretty much halfway through the year. I know we talked a lot of macro today, and you know me on the trading side. I always want to talk a little bit about execution. We'll start with you, Michael. What excites you the most for a trade opportunity in the second half of the year? I'm going to keep a close eye on inflation-type trades, trying to take advantage of unexpected inflation. Uh, how to, you could play that in numerous ways, whether it's as we discussed, or if you're more sophisticated, you can do it with swaps, with inflation type swaps, break even swaps. Uh, but that's where I'm going to keep my eye out. And I haven't really done much in that area, but I think that's, that's where I think most investors are off sides thinking that inflation can happen here. And if the Fed continues on the path that they're on, I, I really think that inflation could be something that I, I'm not calling for hyperinflation, but it could be shocking inflation. And that could present some very nice opportunities. Jesse, what's something that you're keeping an eye on for a potential trade between now and the end of the year? You know, I, I've been really bullish on this inflation trade and I and I I've been very bullish on gold, but I have a longer term I think it's a multi year uh time frame. Um but it looks to me like gold could break out at any time. But more specifically, I think between now and the fall, I think we could potentially see a good uh a really good opportunity on the short side. Um I think we've seen uh, there's there's so much uh, you look at the amount of money and leveraged long ETFs, the amount of margin debt that's been piled up in recent years. Um, there's just a lot of uh, euphoria um, that's that's literally been represented in positioning um, that I think that could potentially be unwound. You know, you're talking about the risk parity trade. Um, I, I'm more specifically worried about the short volatility um, or volatility targeting funds, which specifically sell when volatility goes up. And I think, you know, they've probably, as volatility has been falling, you know, have leveraged back up again. 
but it's really, you know, look at, I look at Rydex traders too. And, um, you know, the amount of assets in, in bullish, uh, leveraged bullish funds versus bearish funds is off the chart higher than it was during the dot com. And so I think there's a potential, a, a bunch of euphoria to be, you know, that's, that's gone into leveraged, uh, investments on the long side that could potentially be unwound. And I think there's a window between now and the fall where that could be an opportunity, present an opportunity for people looking uh, to trade on the short side. See, everybody, this is why I read Jesse and Michael, and this is why I read Macro. And it's not because I'm going to execute on the same time frame that they are, but those types of moments in the market where the macro guys like Jesse and Michael give us the insight as to what may potentially change the environment we are in can absolutely help us execute in the short term. Guys, I can't thank you enough, but before I let you go, uh, we'll start with you, Michael. Where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website? Come find me at realinvestmentadvice.com, and I publish every week. And you can uh, also see the publishings of Lance Roberts and uh, many other uh, guys that we work with. Jesse, uh, Twitter and website, please. Uh, it's at Jesse Felder and uh, the FelderReport.com. I, I don't blog probably as often as uh, Michael does. But I do recommend I subscribe to his stuff and read everything he writes. But uh, see, so yeah, once in a while, I'll, I'll try and put up a blog post at thefelderreport.com. All right, everybody, you know where I stand. I, these two guys are great. I can't thank you guys enough for coming on Futures Radio Show again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.